Good morning. What an honor to be introduced by your Teacher of the Year. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I spent several years uh, working in uh, Governor Hunt's Institute, and uh, saw North Carolina is the beacon of the South, uh, a very hopeful and forward-looking educational program. And the message I want to bring you is firstly that you should know the good news nationally because it's contrary to the message we hear so often from people on TV. And that is that the test scores of American students today are the highest they've ever been in history. For white students, black students, Asian students, and Hispanic students, the high school graduation rates today are the highest they've ever been in history for all of these groups. And the dropout rates are the lowest they've ever been in history. You need to know this. This is a real important backdrop. Where we do have an educational crisis is where there is high poverty and racial segregation. Those two in combination are toxic. Now, when we discuss school reform, it's useful to bear in mind what the top performing nations in the world do. They do not have charters. They do not have vouchers. They have a strong public school system. They fund their schools equitably so that there are minimal, if any, differences between the resources available to schools in different areas, in different neighborhoods. They treat teachers with respect as the professionals they are. They recruit highly motivated people into teaching, and they make sure that they have a strong professional education. And then they do their best to support and retain them as career professionals. They do not permit inexperienced amateurs to become teachers or principals or superintendents. Their schools have the resources they need for the children they enroll, and they have the unified support of the local community. They make sure that children are healthy and ready to learn. They do this not out of a spirit of charity, but because they know that their children are their society's future, and they invest in their well-being. This is what successful nations do. Unfortunately, this is not what North Carolina is doing. For many years, North Carolina's elected officials worked together in a bipartisan manner to build a good public school system. And North Carolina saw positive results of these efforts. On the latest federal test called the National Assessment of Educational Progress, North Carolina students performed very well. Students in fourth and eighth grade were reading above the national average which is impressive for a southern state with, a, with large rural areas and high levels of child poverty. The child poverty rate in North Carolina is 26%, which is above the national average of 22 or 23%. The national average in, of child poverty is many times more than the child poverty rate in high-performing nations. And yet we dare to compare ourselves to those countries and say we're going to achieve equity with them and test results when we're not addressing the fundamental cause of low test scores, which is poverty. Uh, in Finland, which you've heard about, which has a great education system, less than 5% of the children live in poverty, as compared to our North Carolina's 26%. Uh, as Professor Jean Nickel of the University of North Carolina wrote just recently, anyone who expects to improve academic performance without reducing child poverty is expecting the impossible. The great majority of have-nots will remain at the bottom of the academic curve, not because they lack brains, not because they lack potential, but because they have not the medical care. They have not the food security. They have not the basic necessities of life. In short, they have not equality of opportunity, and that matters. Now, despite... <laughs> Now, as, as I said, despite this 26% child poverty rate, North Carolina nonetheless has had a very good public school system, or at least it has until recently, when students in North Carolina participated in the international test called TEMS. They performed exceptionally well. Fourth grade students in North Carolina placed among the highest performing nations in the world. No other state that participated in the TEMS test performed that well. That is a great tribute to the teachers of North Carolina. On the eighth grade international math test, North Carolina students performed above the US national average. Again, a tremendous performance from this state. And North Carolina has achieved another incredible distinction. 
It has more nationally board certified teachers than any other state in the nation, 20,000 of them. Wake County ranks first in the nation in the total number of National Board of Certified Teachers. Imagine that. Wake County, North Carolina. Now, based on this performance, one would think that your governor and your General Assembly would work hard to support and retain the state's greatest teachers, especially its experienced teachers who can help the newcomers. Unfortunately, they have not. Since the election of 2012, the governor and the General Assembly have enacted a series of laws that treat teachers not like professionals, but like low-level workers who must be punished and chastised and reduced to contract status and told what to do at every turn. North Carolina stands today as a negative lesson to the nation about how to destroy public education and how to dismantle the teaching profession. That may sound harsh. Unfortunately, it's true. Watching events unfold over this past year in North Carolina has been like watching a tragedy unfold, act by act. Intelligent, well-educated people are passing laws that will cripple public education and are driving away the, the state's best teachers. You saw them in the earlier panel, some of them. But this makes no sense. The duly elected officials of this great state are destroying the very institution that made the state great and demoralizing the very people who are trusted every day to care for his children. It's like watching a farmer burn his seed corn, set fire to his fields, and kill his livestock. It makes no sense. In the not-so-distant past, thanks to the bipartisan leadership of Governor Jim Hunt, teachers in North Carolina were paid about the same as the national average. Today, their pay has stagnated and they rank either 46th or 48th in the nation in pay. This is a shameful statistic. Teachers once gained extra pay for getting advanced degrees, but the General Assembly decided the teachers did not need any additional education, would not pay them to study more about their subject or to learn more about educating children with disabilities, would no longer give extra pay for those who wanted to improve their knowledge in education. Let's put it this way. The General Assembly said to the state's teachers, you don't need any more education. You have enough. What message does that send about the value of education? Not a good one. The General Assembly enacted a plan to eliminate tenure, or career status, which teachers earned after four years of satisfactory service, replacing it with contracts of one, two, or three, or four years. This is supposed to make it easier to fire teachers. The legislature seems to think that the state has a plague of bad teachers, and they want every teacher to live in fear of being fired. This is not a good feeling. Teachers in North Carolina never really had tenure. In higher education, tenure means lifetime employment. In K-12 education, career status means due process, the right to a hearing in the event of dismissal. Teachers in North Carolina have been eligible to earn career status for nearly 50 years, but the General Assembly has seen fit to eliminate it. So if a teacher is falsely accused by a student, and that happens, or if a teacher dares to teach a book that someone in the community disapproves of, she may be fired without a hearing. If a principal or school board member doesn't like a teacher for whatever reason, he or she may be fired without a hearing. This is not just a loss of a minimal amount of job security. It is not just the loss of a right to a fair hearing. It is the loss of academic freedom. This harms not only teachers, but students as well, who may never learn about modern science, because some find it controversial, who may never read a book by John Steinbeck, or Ernest Hemingway, or William Faulkner, or Ralph Ellison, because some parent doesn't like it, and who may never learn to ask questions about history, but just to parrot what's in the textbook, lest someone in the community disagree. This is not 21st century education. This is 19th century education. It's going backwards. <laughs> The legislature wants districts to offer the top 25% of teachers a bonus of $500 a year for, five, for four years to abandon their right to due process. Who will be the top 25%? No one knows. It's somewhat ironic, isn't it, to offer a reward to what presumably are your best teachers so that it's easier to fire them. <laughs> 
Now, not content to destroy the conditions that contribute to a sense of job security and professionalism, the General Assembly lifted the limits on class sizes. Even as the number of students in the state has increased, the legislature has cut the school's budget. More than 5,000 teachers, nearly 4,000 classroom aides have been laid off. This means that working conditions will deteriorate as teachers have more children in each classroom, some of whom have disabilities, some of whom are English learners, and they will do so with less money for textbooks and other instructional materials. North Carolina now, now ranks 48th in the nation in per pupil funding. One of the nation's shining lights is going out because of unwise decisions by the state's leaders. Now, the, the General Assembly seems to be obsessed with the idea that North Carolina has large numbers of bad teachers, and many of them must be fired. All of them must be fired. But what they've managed to do is to demoralize the entire teaching staff. North Carolina, as you saw in the earlier panel, is losing some of its best teachers. They're leaving the state to teach elsewhere, or they're going into another field where they may get more money or be treated with respect. It takes 15 years in North Carolina for a teacher to reach $40,000 a year. Uh, there are many people who pay their entry-level secretaries more than that. Uh, five years ago, 35% of the teachers who left their jobs were experienced teachers. Last year, the proportion of experienced teachers who left, who quit, was 50%. North Carolina is bleeding talent. North Carolina is bleeding experience. North Carolina has a brain drain caused by bad policy. Now, I know that many people say that education should be run more like a business. It's worth noting that our best businesses, our greatest corporations, do not operate with a climate of fear. They choose their employees carefully, and then they pamper them, they support them, and they do their best to hold on to them. W. Edwards Dimming, the great guru of American business, the man credited with Japan's economic transformation, strongly opposed pay for performance. He said, a good system, a great system encourages teamwork and collaboration and treats people with respect. People are selected into the system carefully and then incorporated onto the team. But North Carolina is not building that kind of system. To add insult to injury, the General Assembly eliminated the funding for North Carolina's nationally recognized Teaching Fellows Program, which prepared future teachers in an intensive program in the University of North Carolina system. In 2012, the UNC system graduated 2,554 new and well-prepared teachers. Past experience shows that 75% of these UNC teaching fellows will remain in the classroom for at least five years. They intend to be career teachers. Now, while cutting this highly successful North Carolina teaching fellows program, the General Assembly provided $6 million to Teach for America for its young recruits, many of whom come from other states, all of whom have only five weeks of training. After five years, no more than 10% of the TFA recruits will still be in the classrooms of North Carolina. This is short-term thinking at its worst. This makes no sense. Why would the legislature prefer to pour millions of dollars into a program that produces inexperienced, ill-trained young people who commit to stay for only two years while getting rid of a program that produces North Carolina-based career educators. It only makes sense if you assume that the, that the legislature does not want career educators to teach the children of North Carolina. And that makes no sense. As you might expect, educators are appalled by what the legislature has done. Yes, they are appalled by the budget cuts, by the layoffs, by the attacks on their profession, by the stagnation of wages. And many are thinking that North Carolina is not a good place to be a teacher anymore. Just last December, Professor Scott Emig and Robert Smith of the University of North Carolina in Wilmington released a survey of North Carolina teachers and administrators about the state legislative changes. Over 96% of them said the state is headed in the wrong direction. That's a pretty strong no vote. Two thirds of them say the changes have had a negative impact on teaching and learning. Three quarters say that because of the changes, they're less likely to continue working in North Carolina schools. 97% say the changes have demoralized teachers. 98% deplore the removal of financial incentives for higher education for educators. 
90% of both teachers and administrators say that the removal of due process will harm public education in the state. Now, at, this, at the same time that the General Assembly was doing its level best to dismantle the teaching profession and demoralize teachers, it passed legislation to open more privately managed charter schools, including for-profit charter schools, and to establish a voucher program. The governor and the legislature are determined to hand public dollars over to private management with minimal accountability or supervision. Just last month, the State Board of Education approved 26 new charters to open this fall. There are already 127 in the state. By, 20, by 2015, there are likely to be more than 200 charters. One charter operator, not an educator, has collected over $16 million in taxpayer funds over the past five years for running three charter schools in Brunswick County. The operator of this charter chain won another charter school, even though two of his existing charters are under federal investigation. These these kinds of stories are happening all over the country. The money that flows to charter schools and to voucher schools means less money for public schools and a weaker public school system. According to the editor of the News and Observer, charter schools are undermining traditional schools in Durham County. They were supposed to be laboratories for innovation, but the only innovative thing they do is kick out students who are sent back to the public schools. Durham now has 10 charters with another seven on the way. In addition, it has to pay tuition for 300 students who attend charters in other counties. The charters are draining away middle-class children of both races, leaving greater concentration of poor and minority children in the public schools and undoing 20 years of progress towards racial and economic integration in the Durham public schools. Unlike the public schools, the charters don't have to provide transportation, which reduces their appeal to low-income students. Charters have opened the way for increased racial and social segregation. The decisions by the General Assembly are implicitly repealing the Brown decision in Durham and in other urban districts and recreating a dual system of publicly funded schools. Ned Barnett, the editorial page editor of the News and Observer, explains the appeal of charters. They are, he says, they are private schools with public funding. They create enclaves where people can avoid sending their children to school with others who are of a different race or class. They open a path to the resegregation of the public schools. It's past time for candid talk in North Carolina. Those who promote charters in the General Assembly should not claim they will produce better education. How can you say that when the charters are required to have only 50% of their teachers certified? How will you have better education if half the staff is uncertified? Would you claim that you were improving medical care if you opened hospitals where only 50% of the doctors had a license to practice? <laughs> now let's be clear about what's happening in North Carolina. You will get for-profit charters that rely on an inexperienced, low-wage workforce that has constant turnover. You will not attract career educators to these schools. You will save money, which seems to be the goal. You will not have good schools. The nation has experimented with charters and vouchers now for almost 25 years. We now know more than we did in 1990 when we started. We know that charters do not produce innovation. It's rare that they do. We know that some get higher test scores and that many of them fail, but on average, charters do not provide better education than public schools. We know that those that fail remove millions of dollars from the public coffers, and these dollars are never recovered. We know that charter chains will move into North Carolina to take advantage of the opportunity that the General Assembly offers them. Every dollar they get will be taken away from your community's public schools, making them weaker. Many of the new charters will exclude students with disabilities, and English language learners, meaning that the public schools will have disproportionate numbers of the students with the greatest needs, even as their budgets go down and their class sizes grow larger. We know enough now about for-profit charter schools to know how they operate. They will make handsome campaign contributions to elected officials. Their charters will get lots of autonomy and no oversight. They will cut costs to pump up their profits hiring low-wage teachers, possibly putting large numbers of children in front of computers to replace teachers. The more students they enroll, the bigger their profits. 
the bigger their profits, the larger their campaign contributions. The larger their campaign contributions, the more they're protected by their friends against any accountability. This is not a virtuous cycle. This is a vicious cycle. <laughs> the biggest of Ponzi schemes are the online charter schools. They're knocking on your door. They will be here, too. The name of the game for the online charter chains is recruitment and enrollment. Typically in these schools, 50% of students drop out every year. Their grades are low, their graduation rates are low, but the businesses make a lot of money. Every student they enroll will bring full state tuition from what would have been their local school district. It's a win-win for the owners of the online corporation, but it's a lose-lose for the students, the public schools, and the state. The founders of two of Pennsylvania's largest virtual charter schools are currently under indictment for misappropriating millions of taxpayers' dollars, where there is public, fund, public funding and no supervision and no accountability, bad things happen. We've had nearly a quarter century of voucher experiments in this country, and we know a few things about how they work. There are voucher programs in Milwaukee, Cleveland, New Orleans, and the District of Columbia. Evaluation after evaluation shows that they don't have higher test scores than the public schools. In Milwaukee, they have a higher graduation rate, but that's only because most of the kids drop out before they reach their senior year of high school. That improves the graduation rate. Milwaukee is actually a good demonstration of what happens when a district has public schools, charter schools, and voucher schools. The choice schools don't want kids with severe disabilities, so the public schools get more of them. The choice schools exclude or push out kids that they don't want, the schools choose, not the families. Yet despite their advantages, the choice schools do not outperform the public schools. All three sectors do about the same, and all three sectors are doing very poorly. The charters and vouchers do not save poor kids from failing public schools. Milwaukee is one of the lowest performing districts in the nation. The community support in Milwaukee is divided three ways. No one benefits. And by the way, you should know that vouchers have been put before the voters in state after state again and again. They have never, ever been approved by popular vote. The last, time, the last time vouchers were on the ballot was in Florida in 2012, where they were defeated by 58 to 42. The American people want good public schools. They want good neighborhood schools. They want public schools, not schools run by corporations. The latest Phi Delta Kappa poll showed the highest approval rating ever for neighborhood public schools and the highest disapproval rating ever for vouchers. It also showed the highest possible rating of respect for teachers. The American people respect their teachers, even if the legislatures don't. <laughs> the way things are going now in North Carolina, you will not have a great teacher in every classroom you will have first and second year teachers in most classrooms, and the research is clear that these are the weakest of teachers. They're the newcomers, they're the rookies, they're the novices, they're the apprentices. They need time to learn their craft, and they will be learning on your children. They need experienced teachers to help them, and those experienced teachers are looking at the door about when and how to, to, look, to go. If you had a pain in your chest, would you ask for a young college graduate with five weeks of training or would you try to see a senior doctor? If somebody sued you, would you want to be represented by a young college graduate with a momentary interest in the law, or would you try to hire a senior attorney with long experience? When I fly home later today, I hope I have a pilot with years of experience. <laughs> and not an enthusiastic amateur. When it matters, you want experience. The time has come for North Carolina's leaders and its people to decide whether they truly want a world-class education for the state's young people. You know, there are two different ways to look at education. One is that the schools exist to rank and rate your children. That's what we're doing now. Everybody gets a number, and we're preparing supposedly global competitors. The other way of looking at schools is they exist for the full human development of each and every child to bring out the best potential that each child has. That's what we should have. If you do want a world-class education for the children of North Carolina, the way to go is clear. 
a strong, well-resourced public school system, a highly professional, well-compensated and respected teaching profession led by career educators, and a safety net for the children who live in poverty. There is no other path to success. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take questions, which I think you have, yes? Well, my first question is, where does this kid keep coming from? <laughs> We've got a bunch of questions, and I'll try to get through as many as I can, so if you can try to keep your answers succinct yes. and see what we can do here. Otto Salberg is a gift from God. <laughs> this is sort of a clustering of questions. Where are poor children doing well? What are these areas doing? And are you saying that there are no charter schools that are doing well for poor children? Okay, the first part of the question repeat again. Where are poor, where are ch poor children doing well? So mm -hmm. disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged students. What is being done? What are the strategies being used? And I think the third question is sort of, a charter school is not a part of that strategy. Are there none of, no charter schools that are serving those populations well? Well, um, here's the, the deal with testing. The nature of standardized testing is that it ranks kids along a, a normal curve, a bell curve. Poor kids cluster at the bottom, affluent kids cluster at the top. The bell curve is unforgiving. It always has a bottom half and a top half. And the bell curve, the standardized testing, is an accurate reflection of socioeconomic status. It predicts more than anything else family income. And there are some kids who are poor who will break through and get to the top half, and there are some kids who come from wealthy families who don't care or who are dumb or whatever, who slip to the bottom. But that curve is an unforgiving curve. So there is no place where you can point to and say, in this district, poor kids have closed the achievement gap, because the achievement gap is itself an artifact of standardized testing. Standardized testing measures and, and reflects the achievement gap. So if your goal is the full human development of every child, whatever their background, whatever their zip code, uh, you will not be using standardized tests to do this. This is why one of the things I admired so much about Finland, but I also noticed in all of the very best private schools, they don't use standardized tests at all, because standardized tests are just an administrative convenience to label kids. So I would like to see a system where labeling is far less important. Uh, and where kids are not told in third grade that they failed, and that they're failures. That's wrong. That, that destroys their self-confidence and destroys their willingness to keep trying. As for charter schools, my uh, concern is that they have, they began as a great idea, uh, that they'd be laboratories of innovation. They have turned into uh, an instrument of, of, of making money uh, in many places. There are a lot of them that make a lot of money, either the people running them or the people who are investing in them or the hedge fund managers who are promoting them in state after state. It's an entrepreneurial activity uh, that, where the goal of the game is who can get the highest test scores. Getting the highest test scores doesn't mean you're a better school than the school next door. It may mean that you've been more careful in kicking out the kids who get low scores. So my idea of what the role that charter schools should play is that they should go back to the original concept of being problem solvers. They should take the kids that public schools really haven't been good at helping and show that they can teach them in a different way and share what they know with the public schools. Don't compete, collaborate. That can happen. So, Dr. Ravitch, I, I just want to go back to the first question because I'm not sure that you answered the question as it appears to me on my text. I, I think this questioner is looking for some particular strategies. Are, are there some strategies, not about how you evaluate, but how you teach kids from economically disadvantaged backgrounds? 
Well, first of all, I would have asked that question of the last panel because they're teachers. I'm a historian. And what I have seen over time is based on you know, my research and my knowledge and understanding that poor kids need a full and rich curriculum, particularly one that's rich in the arts, because they need many ways to express themselves, to express their enthusiasm. Uh, their families should be involved in the process. Their families, their mothers, their grandparents, whatever, uh, whoever is bringing them up should be treated and welcomed in the school and treated with respect. Uh, and the school should be a welcoming environment where people of the family understand that, this, that we're all in this together and that the school is not there to make their f kids feel like failures, but rather to support them to become the best they can be, to help them become successful in their life. Uh, and we have to have these larger life goals for children than simply the test scores. It's very hard for people in this country to back away from test scores, test scores. And I heard this this morning. Uh, I happen to have grown up in an era, uh, because I'm older than most of you, when we didn't even take standardized tests. Um, and that's hard to imagine. But the standardized testing industry has bought America, and we have to fight back. It's ridiculous. Our children mean more to us than, than a number. They're not data points. They're children. They're human beings. But, so so, so what, what minority children need is what they would get if they went to Andover or Exeter or the nation's finest private schools. They need, they need small classes. They need extra help. They need teachers who are specialists at helping them with language difficulties, learning difficulties. They need the special education help. They need the, the specialist who can say, who can diagnose their problem and then help them solve the problem and keep up with their peers. Smaller class sizes is number one. The arts, number one. Those are two big things. Right. So all the rest of you who are trying to blow up my tablet, forgive me, but I can only ask one more question. Um, and I want to pick up on your point about being a historian. You focused a lot on recent activities, changes in North Carolina. But this question asks you as a historian to try to pinpoint when the mood changed and the public began to lose trust in our public schools. Well, uh, the question is, when did the public lose trust in our public schools? What I see in the Phi Delta Kappa is the public has never lost trust in our public schools. But the question is, when did a movement develop to, do, to really disinherit our public schools? And I, I would have to trace that back to 1983, when there was a report called The Nation at Risk that said our public schools are so mediocre that our nation is at risk. Now, what's interesting about that report, and if you go back and read it, you'll see that all this talk about a rising tide of mediocrity and the international test scores and so forth. From 83 until the present, that's a, a long time and uh, well over a quarter century, we've outperformed every nation in the world. They were wrong. And they were blaming our public schools. Then you hear people on TV today say, well, look at the international test scores. Uh, we're lagging, we're failing, blah, blah, blah. First international test was given in 1964. We came in dead last. And we have, over the past 50 years, outperformed every other nation that had higher test scores. Now, why is that? because those kids in those nations were good at taking tests and they had higher test scores. But first of all, 15-year-old test scores do not predict the future of your economy or your society. We know this now. Uh, but secondly, our trump card is not test scores, it's creativity, it's innovation, it's ingenuity, it's risk taking. So I think that our you have to not listen to the naysayers, and that's why I opened my talk today by saying, in fact, the test scores, which we value so much these days, are the highest they've ever been in history. The graduation rate's the highest they've ever been in history. The dropout rate's the lowest ever in history. The public has not lost trust. Our policymakers in Washington and our state capitals have, and we have to change our policymakers. Thank you.